Welcome to the tip channel. That is perfection. We finished up our electrical work this morning and now we're going to get ready to do the ceiling. Uh, we're going to insulate everything uh, not to keep the heat in or keep the cool in uh, but just for soundproofing. So we'll be using um, fiberglass insulation throughout the entire project with the exception we have a piece of duct work um, that is running into the bathroom and we're a little concerned that if the garage doors are left open and the AC is on upstairs we could get, could get some um, condensation. So what we're going to do is a piece of rigid insulation underneath of this to keep the heat away from the duct so that we don't have to worry about condensation. We finished insulating our ceiling and I put up 7 16 OSB. Now the reason for the OSB is that we're going to put strips of wood on the ceiling and if there's any little gap in between of the strips of wood instead of seeing insulation we're going to see OSB so it's going to look like natural wood underneath of it. Uh, whenever we go to put the strips up we're going to be using a construction adhesive on the rear side of the board. Now I'm a cabinet guy and a cabinet guy will tell you it's not the nails and staples that hold a cabinet together, it's the glue. The nails and staples are only there to hold it into place while the glue is drying. So we'll be using some construction adhesive. And I'm going to be shooting the boards up with what's referred to as a pin tacker. Now, the industry came out with these, and they're a 23 gauge. Now, they're about the size of a needle. Now, they don't have a head on them. So what I'll do is, as I'm nailing my boards... I'll go one at an angle like this and one at an angle like that so that the two pins are working to hold the board from coming down. Now, if I end up with a board that's a little warped, I may want to have to shoot a 18 gauge nail in. But let me show you the difference between these two. This is a 23 gauge. And as you can see, it's about as thin as a needle. So very small head. Once these goes in, you don't even notice them. Now an 18 gauge, that's what we're talking about. So a fairly large size head, and naturally you will see the hole that these make. Now we are going to be using some wormy oak on the ceiling as well. Uh, and with the worm holes in the oak and what have you, if we see a couple 18 gauge nails, it's just going to blend right in. Um, the look that we're going for with this ceiling, I wouldn't refer to as rustic. I have done rustic ceilings before where we actually use rough cut lumber um, and that would be rustic. Here, what I need to do is to hire some writers, come up with some cool names like Shabby Chic or Rustic by Design. That's it. I'll hire some writers. We completed our ceiling today. I know I still don't have a name for it. I asked the homeowner. And he said, ooh, that's cool. Yeah, we need a little better name than ooh, that's cool. I asked my wife about the possibility of hiring some writers. She said, I've got to get a whole lot better at these YouTube videos before I can pay out for some writers. Now, before you start your insulation, don't forget about your blockers. Go ahead and put your blockers in for your tile bars and your toilet paper holders. Measure where they're at, take photographs so that you know where they are. Tips on putting up insulation. Do you have a teenager at home? If so, tell them to do it. What, you never heard of Tom Sawyer and the painted white picket fence? <laughs> Seriously though, if you're cutting something for length, I like to use a framing square, put it down on the edge, I've got a mark for my length, and, uh, and then push down on it. And with it squeezed down, it's a lot easier to cut. Now I do like these new snap-off blades for cutting insulation. And what I'm talking about is that you can take and slide the blade out so that you can cut very deeply through the insulation. As the end of the blade gets stall, you just simply snap it right off. Now there's several tools in order to staple up insulation. Uh, for the staple length you want quarter inch or five sixteenths. So there's a couple different ways of stapling up the insulation. One is you can bend over the tab and staple it to the face of the 2 before. Um, 
Here's the problem with that, is that, as I mentioned, I like to glue things, especially drywall. Uh, if you glue the drywall, it doesn't require nearly as many screws, and you don't have as much problems with screws popping later on. So what I do instead is I staple to the inside. Now, as I mentioned, there's several different staplers. I do like this, this arrow one. And uh, there is some that you use your hands to squeeze, other that, uh, or electric, you just push the button. Um, this IRO one does handle two racks of staples, I like that. And also, it's like using a hammer. Now, I will mention to you, keep your fingers out of the way, because yes, it hurts just like a hammer. But the weight of the tool does the job, and it's just that simple. We're getting ready to put up our hardy backer. Now in this bathroom, we're gonna have three tiles high. Each tile is about 13 inches. So we're looking at approximately 39 inches whenever we finish out. Um, the hardy backer is 36. So that will actually overlap the drywall about three inches at the top. Uh, so it'll give us a nice transition. We don't have to worry about uh, this seam where the drywall is coming together with the hardy backer. Now, I do like using Hardy Backer for a couple of different reasons. First of all, uh, adhesion. Uh, the, the tile naturally adheres very well to the Hardy Backer. Also, the Hardy Backer is a lot more rigid than what drywall is. So if someone bumps against the wall, um, you don't have to worry about busting a piece of tile or a piece of tile popping loose or cracking a grout joint. Um, so basically when we attach the hardy backer, we want to go about every eight inches. Uh, we want it secured very, very well. Stay away from the corners, however. Go down about two inches before you put a screw because it will bust the corner off fairly easy. Now for attaching these, we're using a hardy backer screw. Uh, inch and five eighths. And this screw has a little rib on the back. And uh, I don't know whether you can pick that up. And that little rib is cutting right into the hardy backer material. So the screw goes completely in. We're getting ready to cut our hardy backer. Now there's a couple different ways to cut the hardy backer. If the piece that you're cutting is over six inches, you will be able to score it and then snap it off. Now for that, they make a knife. And this nice ha knife has a carbide tip on it and you just simply score the material. So I got my T-square up here, my dimension. I want to score this two or three times. Now I can snap it. Now, four pieces, six inches and under, I use a jigsaw. Uh, jigsaw, I've got a blade made for cutting this type of material. It's an old jigsaw, so I don't have to worry about getting the uh, concrete material up inside of it. If you need to drill a hole, you can use normal hole saws. Uh, you can also use spin bits. Uh, it's fairly easy actually to drill through. <coughs> cutting drywall is about the same as cutting the hardy backer. With the exception, you're going to use a sharp utility knife. And you're only going to score one time. So you score it, snap it off, take your knife, and cut through the back paper. Then you have a drywall rasp. It just sort of cleans up the edge. And this sheet's ready to go. Okay, we've started to hang our drywall. And we have drywall adhesive on every stud. Now, for the screw spacing, what you're looking at is that the middle of the sheet is going to be every 16 inches. Or what that means, this is a four foot sheet. So we're looking at one up the top, one here, one here, and one here. So four screws, 16 inches apart. Now on your edges, 
you want to double that. You want to go every eight inches. So it'll be basically every X on this manufacturer's drywall coming down the edge. Now, this is a drywall screw gun. Now, what it does is it actually creates a little dimple on the drywall so that you have a place to put your mud. And uh, basically, it's very, very simple. Okay, and that puts the little dimple in the drywall. So the screw recesses just a hair and also gets the dimple in there. Now, you don't have to invest into a drywall screw gun. I've done a lot of drywall over the years, so naturally I did. They make this little piece, and you can pick it up at just about any lumber yard. But what you're looking at is it has a Phillips bit, and it's got that same dimple effect. So if you put this in your impact gun, it'll do just as well as what the drywall screw gun does. I refer to this tool as a roto zip. I'm going to assume that roto zip was probably the first manufacturer that brought this tool out. But basically what it is, it's about a one-eighth of an inch blade, and at the very end of it, uh, you can see that the cutter stops about a quarter of an inch from the end. Uh, now, I know I have an outlet box here, and what I've done is I've marked the center of that outlet box. What I'm going to do is poke through, that's my center, I'll come over and find my edge, and then I will cut around this. Now, this tool rotates in a, counterclock in a clockwise direction. So whenever you go to cut it, uh, cut your outlet, it is better if you go counterclockwise. And as you can see, perfect outlet hole. We got all of our drywall hung. Now we're ready to start finishing. Now, I am not a drywall finisher. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there that will help you with this. Um, basically, I've only got four seams, four corners to do. Uh, I'm putting a piece of cherry trim along the ceiling so I don't have to worry about getting close to the ceiling. While our drywall mud is drying, we decided to go ahead and throw up some beadboard on the exterior. Now, this product has three plies to it. So it's just like the plywood you would use on a roof. Now, first of all, I have three words for you. Adhesive, adhesive, adhesive. I am going to be shooting this up with an 18 gauge Neller instead of the pin tacker, because uh, this product will have a 10 to one of warp. So uh, we want to glue it well, we want to screw it well, and this is where taking the time to actually level everything up, square everything, really comes into play, because now everything just fits properly. I can't emphasize enough, level and square, level and square. It makes the end project so easy. I just finished my second coat of drywall mud, and at this point, I normally go ahead and sand out just so I can see my high, my low spots before I put my third coat on. Uh, I thought I would take a break and um, spend a few minutes to talk about some things to help you with this process. Number one, wood ceiling. <laughs> it takes about 90% of your drywall out. Also, beadboard on the exterior, a nice basement garage look, very durable. Don't have to finish any drywall out there. So basically what we're left with is this uh, wall area in here. And a couple of different things. Number one is they came out with this product, which is called Ultra Lightweight Compound. Now, this used to be in a five gallon pan, but now as you can see, just like everything else, it's a four and a half gallon bucket. Things become smaller and more expensive. But anyways, this will sand a whole lot easier than the older compounds. That's why I'm suggesting this. They say that a good drywall finisher can put the mud on to where he barely has to touch it with sandpaper. That's not me. Now, you don't want to use this straight out of the bucket. I normally take and put about four or five inches into a clean five gallon bucket. And then you want to stir that up. Now, I use about half a bottle of water. Uh, I stir it with my Whirly Bird, 
what it's my tool i can call whatever i want <laughs> anyways stir it up that'll take the air out it'll also um thin it you don't want it too thin to where it's falling off of your trowel but at the same time you want it to glide smoothly so a whirly bird is a uh, good tip for your product now as you're sanding your walls it does help if you have a portable light and you can actually look right up that wall now one thing that i always say also is that your fingers can feel a whole lot more than what your eyes can see so take your hands and run it over it you'll, you'll find a rough spot that you didn't detect with your eyes that you need to address naturally you think you have everything perfect and then you put the paint on it's like oh man where did that come from now one more tip is that i suggest using 3m sanding blocks now these sanding blocks are nice in that they've got a square side they've got a point on so they're easy to get into places they're easy to handle and do a real nice job relatively inexpensive we've completed our drywall finishing now if you're anxious to get painting and you only have a few spots to touch up they do make a product that dries in 45 minutes i believe they even make one that dries in 25 minutes now this is a powder form i uh, just mix it up with some water and it's good to go but very quick in regards to dry time on this product now another thing that you can do as well is put fans again in the room to do some circulation to get things to dry and the last thing you, that you can also do is use a heat gun and the heat gun will help to dry things out so at this point we're ready to start painting and the first thing that we want to use is a drywall primer now the drywall primer will seal the drywall and seal the mud so that your paint just doesn't keep soaking into the product so uh, definitely is a good step to do after you apply this it'll take about an hour for it to dry and then you're ready to start your paint now this is also a good step that if you see some an imperfection in your drywall you have a chance to touch it up before the paint so catch it while it's wet uh, pay close attention if you see a spot that needs addressed you know go ahead and do it before you hit it with the paint um, now next step naturally is the painting now when i was a youngin my mama would call some friends and relatives they would all get together and have a painting party those days are long gone um anyways in regards to paint i do like sherman williams paint a lot of painters will tell you they do make some of the best paints do not get cheap on paint i always thought that i was a crappy painter here i was just buying crappy paint so spend a few bucks extra get the good stuff and like i said you'll end up with a good quality project we just finished putting a coat of primer on the bathroom and uh, i thought it would take a few minutes to uh, straighten up the job site and i realized i need a couple of hours but instead i'm going to go ahead and throw a couple of points out to you guys uh, in regards to painting that hopefully it will help first of all for cutting in now in our case we don't have a whole lot of cut in uh, to do but even if you have a lot of trim around doors baseboard and what have you I strongly recommend a good paintbrush now this one's made by Purdy it's called a XL medium stiff two and a half inch angled brush now if you take care of your brushes they'll last a long time but this is a fantastic brush for cutting in around baseboards now for the rollers Purdy makes a uh, great roller and it's called a marathon now uh, i normally buy the three pack uh, as uh, naturally i go through them i use a 3 8 snap now this will give you a nice smooth surface on the wall um, another tip is these little gadgets here now what they do is this they simply snap right in the inner ring of a can so that as you're pouring the paint out of the can your entire rim is not filling up with paint i can't tell you how many times over the years i've mixed some paint in a bedroom or what have you went back to my original can which yes i keep 
my wife says I'm cheap. I'm like, no, I'm just frugal. But uh, I go back and I find that the paint's dried up. Don't get paint in the rim of the can and you'll be able to seal it up and shelf life and it'll last for a good long time. So these, very inexpensive, a very good tool to have. Um, this is a paint cup and this is actually made by Werner. Now, the nice thing about this is it has a magnetic right on the inside. So as you're moving from area to area on your project, you can take your paintbrush and lock it right up there and it's not soaking all the way down in your paint. Now, as you're cutting in, what you want to do is I see so many people dip it in and then they wring off the excess on the side of the thing. You don't want to do that. Dip it in. You want about an inch on your brush and you want to tap it on each side of your container to take off the access and then you're ready to do some serious cutting in. Um, in regards to your rollers, if you run out of paint or if it's time for lunch and you want to take a break, you can take an empty shopping bag, put it around your roller and stick it in the refrigerator. It's good for a couple hours. If it's going to be overnight, you can actually even stick it in your freezer and the next night get it out and let it fall out and you're ready to go again. Do I clean out rollers? No. I just simply toss them whenever I'm done. I use the disposable paint trays. Again, I don't worry about cleaning it out. I just dispose of the disposable tray. Now, just a few more things. Whenever you're ready to dispose of your roller, naturally it's a messy job. What I do is I take an empty shopping bag, put it in, and just simply pull it right off. Now you're ready to toss that in the trash and you haven't got a speck of paint on you. Well, maybe from painting, but just a few other things to share with you. Um, if you have some young people in your home, this is a good project to spend some good quality time with them. That's the problem with our nation today is that we don't have enough young people willing to work with their hands. Who knows? You may have a Michelangelo on your hands. But this is a good project to share with a young man. Tell them it's a party. I was there. I witnessed the painting part. Uh, good times all good times held by all. We're ready to start painting. Now my client has chose a color from Sherman Williams called Intellectual Gray. What a wise choice. I do think it's going to work perfect for our bath. It's going to work really nice with the ceramic towel we have chosen. The rustic wood ceiling that we did is going to pop with the dark color that we're using on the wall. Uh, so very wise choice. Now, in regards to the sheen on the paint, if you did the drywall work yourself, use flat paint. Do not go into semi-gloss or gloss. It is going to show any minor imperfection in your drywall work. So flat paint. And if you go to Sherman Williams and you get the good quality of paint, you still will be able to wash down the walls if you choose to. Anyways, load your roller up. Not too much, not too little. We're going to do a Y pattern. I, we're going to do a W pattern about a three foot square and then we'll fill in now with your roller not too hard not too light if you go too hard trying to get as much paint out of the roller as you possibly can you'll notice that there's like a little in trail coming off of your roller if you see that you want to go back over the spot and even it out beautiful morning in pennsylvania 48 degrees Fall weather's finally arrived. Getting rid of that 92 degree summer heat. Sun's popping up over the trees. Gonna be a beautiful day. We're moving on to something a little more enjoyable today. We're gonna start our ceramic towel. Now, as I look at doing my ceramic towel, what I sort of look at is um, what's gonna be my focal wall. Now, in our case, we're coming in the bathroom door there. We have a commode here, we have a urinal here. And this is the first wall we see. So in my mind, this is our focal wall. So I'm going to start with this wall. And the reason that I'm doing that is that I'll run my towel to the corner and then my next wall will be over top of this one. What that means is, is that my seam where my two corners come together 
if it's off a little bit, someone's going to have to stand here and look there this way to see down. Versus if I run this wall first and then run this one into it, my seam's in this direction, so you're looking right into it. So just a little quirk of mine, but uh, like I said, it does work very nice. Now, I've done a center line on my wall. This is my center, and uh, that's where I'm going to start my towel, and then I'll work outwards. Uh, starting at the center, again, this is the focal point, so this is what we're looking for to be as perfect as possible. Um, so this is my center. Now, I've calculated it out that I'll end up with approximately about a nine inch piece, uh, which is good. Now, we're going to actually stagger our towel. What that means is, is that my next row, I'm going to offset it like this. So I've done a second line here. Now, if you weren't going to stagger and you were going to stack them on top of each other like this, then you, you want to run your calculation and see how that comes out. Uh, if you end up with a one or two inch piece on each side, you don't want that. So here's what you would do. Let's just say, for instance, you're working with a 12 inch by 12 inch towel. And we know that that, that um, piece is going to be about two inches. Take the dimension of your towel, which is 12 inches, divided by two, which is six, and add the two inches to it. So now you're going to end up with an eight inch piece on each side. So what you would do is your center line, you'd want to go off by six inches to start your towel. And that'll end up with an eight inch piece on each side. Now I've set my laser uh, to see how level this floor is. And I've went around and marked uh, at each stud location approximately what it is from the floor to that uh, laser line. Now in my case, I'm off about three eighths of an inch uh, from this corner to here. Now, I know that my floor ceramic is going to be about a quarter of an inch with thin set, maybe about three eighths. Still, what I'll do is I'll shim these level across this wall and I'll trim just a little bit off of my towel whenever I get to that wall. Um, so if it was worse than that, let's just say for instance that your floor is off an inch or an inch and a half. What I would suggest is, is to take and screw a ledger board up off of the floor, uh, a little uh, underneath the height of the tile, and screw that into place and run your tile up above. Once those are set up, pull the ledger board out, and then cut the tiles uh, for the last row coming down to the floor. We're getting ready to mix up our thin set. Now I do find it a little easier if you put just a little bit of water in the bottom of the bucket first. Then I put about four or five inches of the product in there and we're going to mix it up with the Whirly Bird. Uh, with the consistency that we're looking for is like peanut butter, uh, like toothpaste. You don't want it too runny, don't want it too thick. Now if it starts to stiffen up on you a little bit uh, as you are starting to put up your towel, naturally you can add a little bit more water to it. Like I said, you don't want it too dry and you don't want it too thin. One of the first pieces of towel that I have to put up uh, has the supply line coming into it uh, for the toilet. So naturally we need to drill a hole. Now I'll be using a carbide bit made for uh, drilling this. As I start to drill I'll also add a little bit of water uh, to my cut uh, just to keep the blade cool. Now what I'm talking about is this has carbite all the way around it and a uh, carbite tip as well in order to drill through ceramic. All right, we're ready to start laying our towel. Now, I'm doing a 12 by 12 towel, so I'm going to be using a trowel that's quarter inch uh, wide and quarter inch deep. Uh, now, there's two ways to do this. Number one is you can put the mud on the trowel, put it across the wall. Now. If you choose to do that, I strongly suggest to take a spray bottle and spray down the hardy backer just so that the um, thin set doesn't dry too quickly on you. Now, in my case, uh, these first towels, I've got some obstacles to work around, uh, what have you. I've got to shim this level. So it's going to go a little slow at first. So what I'm going to do instead is called back buttering. Now all that simply means is that we'll take the thin set 
and put it on the rear of the towel and we will spread it. Now you can use the large trowel if you want. You can use a small trowel, whatever you choose to use. Uh, but basically back butter the towel and then it's ready to go. Now let's talk about uh, grout spacing or joint spacing I should say. Uh, basically what we're working with today is a Maserati towel. And Maserati towel is a high-end uh, porcelain towel. Fairly accurate. A lot of the towel out there nowadays is very inaccurate. Uh, it can go out of square uh, 30 seconds, 16th of an inch. So if you put two pieces together, you're going to find that it may be touching at the top, but down at the bottom you get an eighth of an inch gap. So if you're going to use a less expensive towel, uh, you may want to go up to as much as a quarter inch grout spacing. Uh, naturally, with a quarter inch grout spacing, you can cheat the tiles a little bit so that everything looks good whenever you're done. Uh, in our case, because we're using the Maserati, we're going to do about a sixteenth of an inch uh, grout line. Uh, whenever we go to do the floor, uh, I will be doing a um, I will be doing a quarter inch grout line on the floor. In regards to your grout, uh, if it's an eighth of an inch or less, you can use unsanded grout. Above that, uh, you would want to use a sanded grout. Now, again, the industry is always changing. I did notice they now also have a grout that, it, that will work for either one. Uh, if you're going to be in a area that's going to have a lot of dampness and what have you, you may want to look at adding a product to um, slow down any mold growth. But we're going to start very slow, do some back buttering, uh, and get this product up. We're ready to start cutting our towel. Now you're definitely going to need a wet saw in order to do this. You don't have to buy one. Uh, you can go out to the local rental place and rent one. Uh, I love dual ceramic towels, so I did invest into a towel. Now, when I'm cutting the towel, what I normally do uh, is you can put a pencil mark on the towel, but I like to be fairly accurate. Uh, so it's always that question, do I leave the line, do I take the line, do I split the line? It's a whole lot more accurate if you cheat the towel up to the saw blade, measure over for the dimension that you're looking for, uh, slide back, turn the saw on, and then make your cut. A lot more accurate than a pencil mark. Um, if you are looking at cutting a small piece, some towel manufacturers will provide this. And it's pretty neat because you can do square if you want, or if you need an angle, uh, you can set the angle, you can do 45s, anything like that. Uh, a little quickie, if all your dimensions aren't going to be the same, is just grab a speed square. Now, speed square, you can set right into your, set right up on your saw, and it keeps that sm small piece nice and square with the saw blade. Now, there is going to be times where you're going to need to make a saw cut in the middle of the towel, say, for instance, an outlet or what have you. Now, this particular saw does have a nice feature, which is basically like a plunge cut. You can raise the uh, saw up and then bring it down on your workpiece. We are up to our last row of towel in the bathroom. Now, the Maserati towel that we're working with does not have a bullnose available uh, to match this towel. And what a piece of bullnose is, is that it'll round off at the top, just finishing the top edge of the towel. Now, uh, what we're going to use to finish off the top is a product uh, that's made by Schuler, Schuler, something like that. Anyways, basically what it is is a piece of aluminum, and uh, what it does is it caps off the top of the towel. And let your towel hold up the product. Now once that thin set gets in there, that's not going anywhere. Now this aluminum product, that's what it is, aluminum, uh, very easy to cut. Uh, I actually use my power miter box with the 
same blade that I cut trims and crown moldings and what have you. Doesn't hurt the blade, doesn't hurt the product. Actually, you could use a hand grinder as well. So easy to manipulate. Um, one thing that I did want to mention to you, as you're putting up your towel, you're working with a thin set. Now, thin set is basically a concrete-like material. It's going to dry your hands out. Now, there is a product which I think is called Working Hands. Now, this stuff feels really weird on your hands, but if you apply it before you get started, um, that's a good thing to keep the uh, concrete base from drying out your hands. Naturally, keep a bucket of water and rag as you're doing this. Get the thin set off of your hands. We were able to finish our wall ceramic today. Now, this will need to set up uh, overnight before we can actually do the grouting. Um, this is Friday, so that will be Monday. That should complete it for phase two, and we'll put this puppy to bed next week. Phase three coming. We will be adding phase three to this project as our project continues. If you liked the video today, please like and subscribe, and have a great day.